We all know like charges repel and opposites attract. Simple physics, right? But that same rule shapes the very foundation of how life interacts. Take the COVID spike protein. How does it know out of tens of thousands of receptor on a cell to bind specifically to the ACE2 receptor? So much so that it can hijack the exact doorway into your cells. The secret isn't magic, it's charges. And of course, this doesn't just apply to COVID, it applies to DNA, cell membranes, and more. More importantly, something as fundamental as how genetic information flows in a cell. And we'll certainly build up to that by the end of this video. Speaking of which, this video is the first part of a trilogy within this series. By the end of which, I will hopefully have shown you how life uses the simple rules of physics to bring out order from chaos, giving one of the most fundamental properties of life, self-assembly. Let's get started. We could certainly start by looking at how the ACE2 receptor and the spike protein recognize one another, but this example can feel a little bit intimidating for our first lesson. So instead, let's start with something simpler, something that captures the essence of how all of this works, one we can later extend to the spike protein and eventually to how cells orchestrate their flow of information. That something is DNA. So, in what way do charges play a role in DNA? Well, in every way, from its double helix shape all the way to how it encodes information. And we'll start with the question, why is DNA shaped this way? That is, why is it a helix? And why do the strands in that helix run in opposite directions? To answer that, let me introduce you to the four ways charges can play a role in this molecular world and apply them to DNA. Take an atom, remove an electron, positive, add one, negative, simple ions. But it goes deeper. Put two atoms together and they will still attract. Why? Because they're made of stuff that are charged. The nucleus goes to one side, while the electron goes to another, creating tiny temporary poles, induced dipoles, attracting one another. But if we let them share electrons, if we let atoms share electrons, now you have a chemical bond. Sometimes the electrons are shared equally, sometimes not. And when unequal, you get a permanent dipole, a molecular magnet. And if that dipole involves hydrogen, it can form a hydrogen bond. Ionic bonds are the strongest due to full charges, then come permanent dipoles due to partial charges, and finally, induced dipoles are the weakest. Together, these four forces orchestrate biology. Now, let's apply them to DNA. DNA only forms a stable helix when the two strands are complementary, A's with T's and G's with C's. Well, why is that? If we take a closer look, it's because the pattern of hydrogen bonding of the bases perfectly slot into one another, three bonds for GC and two for AT. And this, this right here is one of the most basic ways charges can convey information. And we'll see more of these in more intricate ways later on. This bonding pattern though is only possible if the other base is flipped upside down. So that's why DNA strands run in opposite directions. If the bases mispair, say G with T, the pattern bends and buckles, making the strands less compatible and more likely to separate. Remember that for later. Now, that's one mystery down. Well, why is it the helix? There are three big reasons. First, ionic repulsion. Each DNA backbone is negatively charged. Twisting keeps those charges as far apart as possible. But that is constrained because of chemical bonds of the backbone. Second, but more importantly, it's the hydrophobic effect. The same one that makes oil not dissolve in water. So let's look at how all of that works and then let's apply this logic back to DNA. Water has hydrogen bonds and hydrocarbons don't. So they mainly work through induced dipoles. So when you drop some oil into some water, it gets expelled because water with its stronger dipoles prefers to interact and bond with itself. Peak narcissism. 
Admittedly, though, this is only half the story. You'll learn the full story in the next chapter. But for now, just internalize that water doesn't mix with oil. So, for DNA, the bases in the center are mostly nonpolar, so the helix forms to hide them from water, tucking them away inward while the charged backbone faces out, attracting the water. The same logic drives cell membranes. The hydrophobic parts hide away from water while the polar parts face it. The helix also lets the bases stack. Their electron clouds align, creating attractions that are a mix of induced and permanent dipoles, stabilizing it further. Voila! The entirety of DNA as we know and love is a result of these four forces, a manifestation of charges. And after all that talk about DNA, that perfectly translates over to our COVID spike protein. The hydrogen bond and charges are placed in very optimized spots. Just like how the bases have to be aligned in DNA for the strands to nicely stick. No, but not just that, the hydrophobic parts that are exposed on the surface of the spike don't want to be in contact with the water, so binding to ACE2 allows them to bury themselves away from the water. This unholy yet perfect combination is what allows the spike protein to recognize ACE2 and slip their way into cells. It's also how cells get their membranes, and it's how DNA gets its signature shape. All guided by these four forces working in tandem, orchestrating biology. But there's one subtle twist left. In DNA, this combination of forces leaves some bases slightly more exposed than others. That exposure is what allows the base sequence to be read, opening our window into controlling the flow of genetic information. And that's where we'll go next. Before we learn about the information flow of a living thing, why don't we first talk about the flow of information into your brain and how our sponsor, Brilliant, can help you excel at that. Brilliant is a learning app designed to be uniquely effective. Each lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with the concepts, a method proven to be six times more effective than watching lecture videos. Brilliant helps you build understanding from the ground up, and it has a perfect mix of engaging problems, competitive features, and daily encouragement that helps you mo keep that keeps you motivated on track. Plus, all content on Brilliant is crafted by an award-winning team of teachers, researchers, and professionals from Stanford, MIT, Caltech, Microsoft, Google, and more. Brilliant helps you build critical thinking skills through problem solving, not memorization. So, just in line with our series. In the next few chapters, we'll see how math is so crucial to biochemistry. So, be sure to check out Brilliant's newly updated math course so that you can build your mathematical intuition while making you a better thinker and problem solver. You'll start at the perfect level and work your way up through interactive challenges that bring abstract concepts to life. Courses focus on the most useful, applicable math concepts, so you'll never feel like you're wasting time. To learn for free on Brilliant, go to brilliant.org slash nanorooms, scan the QR code on the screen and on the link in the description. Brilliant also gives our viewers 20% off on an annual premium subscription, which gives you unlimited daily access to everything on Brilliant. The same forces we saw before don't just assemble life structures. They also drive life's flow of information. I'll take the time to explain the setup first so we can clearly see why the forces are crucial to conveying information. But first, DNA. One of the main things DNA can code for are proteins. And as alluded to in the previous episode, proteins are the workforce of the cell, doing things from grunt work to copying DNA. Proteins are how cells do things, and that's why this series revolves around them. The process of transferring information from DNA into creating proteins is called the central dogma. Three letters of DNA code for one building block of protein, called amino acids. Like DNA's bases, you can stick a bunch of them together to create a protein. But biology adds a little twist. DNA is first transcribed into RNA, which then gets translated into proteins. That detour might seem a little bit unnecessary, but we'll see. This is actually a brilliant design choice by life. From here, I want to show you how nearly every step of the central dogma is governed by the same four forces. To initiate transcription, a protein called RNA polymerase sticks to a rather specific region of DNA that's a little bit upstream of the part that codes for proteins. 
Once it latches on, it transcribes DNA into RNA and so on. But wait a minute, how does it know to stick to that bit of DNA? It has to be able to distinguish the sequences somehow, right? How does it do that? That's right, the four forces. The chain of amino acids in RNA polymerase and its assistant proteins may look randomly tangled and distributed, but their placement is actually very intentional. The part that binds the DNA is rich in positively charged amino acids like lysine and arginine, which are drawn to the negatively charged DNA backbone. Other amino acids form hydrogen bonds with the basis of DNA, recognizing that specific exposed sequence, just like how earlier DNA is able to recognize its own base pair. Then, it can bind to even more parts and eventually allow the RNA polymerase in red here to bind and start transcribing. But here's where it gets good. What if the DNA where the polymerase is supposed to go gets slightly mutated? If the DNA doesn't match well enough, there will be fewer contacts, and RNA polymerase won't get bound for so long, resulting in less transcription. As a result, this, this right here, is one way nature can tune how often a gene is made into a protein by tuning the RNA amount, by tuning the RNA polymerase landing sequence. One big reason why having an RNA layer is super useful. And this is just one example. The same forces make transcription itself a game of base pair matchmaking, the same is true for proteins too. And when the proteins are finally made, those very forces dictate how they fold into shapes. Shapes that need to be precisely tuned so they function properly, just like the spike protein, just like the RNA polymerase proteins, and just like everything we've just seen. All of this, comes from like charges repel while opposites attract. So, before I go, I want to leave you with a paradox that stems from what we've just learned. In salt, sodium and chlorine ions are held together by ionic attractions, right? So, why would it dissolve in water? Why would it spontaneously trade the stronger ionic force for dipole interactions with water? That's weaker, isn't it? If you can answer this, you'll realize why my all-in-water explanation was kind of incomplete. And all will be answered in the next chapter. I'll see you then. If you'd like to help make more videos like this possible, consider joining on Patreon. You'll be part of our Discord community, get na exclusive Nanoroom stickers, and even join one-to-one -one Nanoroom sessions. It's a small way to support us, but it means a hell of a lot. Thanks for watching, and I hope this series helps you see biochemistry in a whole new light.